excited to launch our Hot Pink <laughs> Global Information Society Watch Edition this year with a focus on women's rights, gender and information society. Um, as well as uh, we're also collaborating to launch an edition of MIND, which is a journal focusing on internet governance issues with a um, thematic focus on security um, this year. So I will just start because we're running a little bit late um, and I will first pass the mic to Alan Finlay, who is um, the coordinator of Gizwatch. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm just going to quickly give an overview of uh, uh, this preview edition of, of uh, the women, women's, uh, women's rights, genders, gender and ICTs that you can get a copy at the back. Um, it is a preview edition, which means there are only sample reports in it. Um, the, fi the full final report is available online right now, so you can go to gizwatch.org and you can download the full report. Um, and just a, a, a it, it is available as a print on demand, and this, this is a previous issue that we did, um, which was printed in Holland by Hivas. So it looks really good if you print uh, the full report, and it's not that expensive to do. So if you want to read the full report or, or share it or have it for your research or students or whatever the case may be, you can download it and print it at your local printer. Um, the Gizwatch also has a timeline, which was uh, developed by... The women's program, uh, you'll see it as an insert. Um, it's, it's a nice um, time man, timeline which has got a really cool title that says from string theory um, to close ringers. So that's available inside your Gizwatch. Uh, the, the final rep online report has 46 authors. Um, and apologies to the authors that couldn't be included in the, um, uh, in the, in the preview. Uh, there were a variety of reasons for this, including deadlines and cost. The reports here basically come from a couple of spaces. Um, <laughs> one, one is um, quite a sophisticated uh, theoretical space around women's rights, and the other is a more practical experiential space around um, um, agenda and ICTs, and sometimes they combine both of them. Um, <laughs> nervous attack. Um, <laughs> So you'll see, you'll see two examples of these, these different kinds of reports in the preview. Um, the selections were made um, to try to get regional diversity, um, uh, as well as the diversity of the debates and the issues under discussion. So you'll, in the country reports, you'll see issues like traffic, trafficking in women, women's rights online, um, leadership in the Cook, Cook Islands, and the rights for abortion in the Netherlands. Um, I'll draw your attention to the Korean country report, which... Uh, deals with um, social welfare, digitizing social welfare systems where their argument essentially is that um, efficiency undermines the rights of marginalized groups, in particular women who suffer um, violence in real life and go to shelters. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting discussion. Um, this was a difficult gizwatch to put together um, uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons. So um, uh, uh, thank you for the support from APC and HIVAS and the various staff members and coordinating um, groups uh, um, in APC, as well as um, Lori, who's our um, uh, dedicated uh, proofreader in Uruguay. Um, we have a number of guests here today. We have Visha Vishaka Data from Point of View, um, Anita Gurimurti from uh, IT for Change, Wolfgang Weiss, who's um, uh, from the coordinator of MIND, um, uh, Jeanette Hoffman who is uh, an academic um, at the University of Humboldt, and uh, Monique, who is from HIVAS, uh, who will, uh, I think, give a little, a little welcome. Just now, why didn't you do the... <laughs> you, yeah, okay, so should I play any other questions? Okay, so, um, uh, Monique will welcome uh, everyone, and then I'll frame the discussion, and then hand, up, hand over to Jack. Um, actually, there is a slight change in the program today. Very sorry, Alan to like mess yeah, up your timing. We like to do it uh, the other way around. So th this is the welcome that had to be if before. Um, thank you for joining us for the lunch, lunch break, for yeah, having a lunch together. We intended to have it, uh, like an intended uh, delayed lunch, but uh, already you're eating. Um, the launch of this new Gizwatch report is all about internet on which women have the freedom and capacity to tell their stories, participate in social and political and economic life. 
This freedom, in many ways, is a worth a lot. How can we work towards an open internet with this added value? And how can we build advocacy for internet freedom that includes the principles of free, safer places for women and girls? That's what the Giz Watch this year is all about, women and ICTs. The central theme is a bit of a surprise, maybe. Isn't it always been the focus of HIFOS and APC for many years? And if it's so obvious, so why now this theme? Is mainstreaming women and ICTs not enough? No, because it's about time to put the lessons learned, telling experiences and rich insights together in one report, to produce and share the telling stories and compare notes in a diverse but systematic way. It's very useful to design and develop a sharp planning for our future internet. This report is much needed for an informed, informed debate for more international cooperation but the problem what I see and also what we discuss in this, uh, this brochure is that uh, we understand some of these issues, but it has to be balanced and under the uh, rule of law. So it means as soon as it goes outside of the rule of law, we have institutions like the Spanish Inquisition or the East German Stasi or something like that. And this it gets very delicate. It means you have to have checks and balances also in the security field for surveillance and for the espionage. I know this is extremely difficult, and if you discuss with governmental people, they probably will give you a different perspective. But as we say in this multi stakeholder context, the governments are not anymore the only band in town. There are other stakeholders who can raise their voice and which their positions has to be taken into consideration. And the security field is not exclusive. There is no exclusiveness, internet governance for security. This is part of the internet. Interesting perspective, um, and I guess. Um, let me try and see. So, is that the only role that is kind of like destined for women? In that we have to play the James Bond, the Bond girl, um, and actually reminded me of uh, reading about some of the um, hidden stories of women who were very active in the communist era in Malaysia, sort of like the women communist. Um, Spies, I suppose, you know, they were like very responsible for bringing information from one place to another, but you kind of don't hear about the stories because they are sort of just missing. And I wonder, like, what does it, what, what, what does it mean when some narratives and some experiences and some perspectives are somehow absent from this discussion of internet governance? What impact would it have, actually, in how we imagine what internet governance is and is about, the logic behind it and the processes and the structures in which we frame them? What does this mean? And I will throw this question to Jeanette. Um, I'm not sure I can give a good answer to this, but I would like to start with a different observation. Um, in the early days of the WISIS process, when civil society was still fighting for the general acceptance of the multi-stakeholder process, um, there were many caucuses and diversity was a sort of thing we were really proud of. There was the gender caucus, there were all sorts of caucuses. They came together every night and we always negotiated among ourselves these visions of information societies. Mm -hmm. And that was a sort of very important element of the whole debate and that sort of differentiated uh, us from the government's perspectives. They were div diverse too, but not in the kind of diversity we could bring to the table. And since then, when we now look at the IGF, what the IGF in a way did was black boxing this whole idea about what various stakeholders would be. We sort of, without even noticing it, agreed on multi-stakeholder being technical community, business community, civil society, perhaps academics could also be a group, but none of them displayed any gender perspective. This has completely gotten lost on the sort of general politics of multi-stakeholder. Where the gender component becomes visible again is on the operational level. That is, when we put together panels and all of a sudden we realize they're only men or they're only people from the global north and suddenly the gender perspective is an issue. We need a woman. 
ideally a woman from the global south so that we don't have to increase the panel by too many other people so and in from in, on this sort of practical level then the whole gender perspective becomes a token issue we ceremonialize uh, in a way the whole issue of diversity to a degree where it becomes very shallow and meaningless and how we sort of connect these two levels, the sort of general politics of multi-stakeholder and the operational level of sort of trying to create diversity by putting together bodies on a panel or minds or however you want to see that. That is a difficult issue, not least because by separating these two levels, we... Um, creating a circle where it's very difficult to come up with good reasons why gender should be an issue on this global political, political level. Because we create a sort of, um, as I would call it, um, an absence of alternatives. If, we, if gender becomes a, a sort of mere symbolic issue, we don't see what diversity means. And without that kind of visible diversity, it's very difficult to argue for it. And how we get out of that, I'm not really sure. I think that probably women need to engage with this issue of multi-stakeholder. We debate this at the IGF all the time, but there's never any woman saying multi-stakeholder means more than just fighting for the rights of businesses, technical communities, and civil society. We need to sort of unblack box that process we've gone through the last 10 years. Very insightful. And I guess, oh, thank you, Rosa. Thank you for your contribution. Um, so we have an empty space now for a random expert who would like to come and fill it in. <laughs> yeah, sorry? Any diversity in the room? Yeah? Okay. So if you can tick as many subaltern boxes as possible. I find it very funny. Like sometimes, you know, when I go for like sessions, I'll be like, okay, woman, tick. From the south, tick. Lesbian, tick. So, you know, <laughs> all I need to do is stab myself in the eye and then I'm like, good. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm joking. Of course I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> so Anita, actually this relates to a question that you asked in your paper at Gizwatch. And you asked this very interesting question. Um, can the politics of presence become the power to negotiate? And that was like a subtitle to, one, to your section. And, and I think it relates very much to the issue that Jeanette was raising. You know, it's more than just bodies. It's about presence, it's about visibility, but it's also about defining spaces and um, defining the trope behind it. Thank you very much, Janet. I, I thought that was a very succinct and uh, sharp analysis of what happens to the question of uh, women's rights and gender politics in relation to internet governance. Uh, what I want to actually do is to say that um, invariably, you know, we tend to understand women's rights and gender from the context of diversity and a politics of recognition, which of course has been extremely important in what people have, you know, normally theorized as second wave feminism. Now, the trouble with second wave feminism is before we thought we were getting there, it got happily co-opted by the juggernaut of neoliberalism. So everything is welcome so long as, you know, it's more and more and more different. So you can have different types of things and then that itself, that diversity itself qualifies uh, for some notion of justice. What um, we did at IT for Change was looked at the IGF transcripts. And we traced one word across, this was IGF 2012, six main sessions. And we did a critical discourse analysis of the word access. And we tried to situate it um, against an analysis of women's empowerment, which was defined as encompassing capabilities, access to resources, opportunities, empowerment possibilities, and macro environmental factors. And across the transcript, you find 93 utterances that were um, identified and codified. And we did an interest-based analysis of utterances, who said what, and what can we infer from that. 
And I will skip the key findings and go to the conclusions, which goes back to the question of, you know, how do we go beyond presence into claiming some power to negotiate. The first thing we found is that the agenda of feminism within the IGF focuses on a politics of recognition, which is completely unhinged from a politics of redistribution. And this is in keeping with global trends everywhere. So you do not bring the two together into a politics of emancipation. The second we found is extremely interesting, that whenever people spoke about a female subject or about individuals or, a, or about people, they invariably spoke about a self-governing individual, whereas references to, you know, the, the, the space, the references by the technical community, for instance, to openness or an open space was about the ungovernable global. So here you have a hegemonic discourse where individuals are typically positioned within nation spaces, whereas when you talk in the IGF, people are actually talking about a global governance space with an implicit discourse that it is ungovernable. The third thing we found was that there is an anti-institutionalism anti that dovetails with utterances around multi-stakeholderism. You speak about multi-stakeholderism not in its linkage or connection with democracy, which is important for women, because you can't have any form of justice, let alone gender justice, unless you have visions of democracy. But what we found was the way multi-stakeholderism is uttered in this space is extremely anti-institutional, which means you get dialogue, you get dialogue as voice without agency. So all of us can speak voice without agency, and participation as presence without politics. So I will leave you with those thoughts. And, um, and the issue, therefore, is in the space of internet governance, how do you bring um, the discourse of emancipation? Thank you, Anita. And um, that also makes me wonder, like when we talk about internet governance and when we talk about distributed um, points of um, governance, where governance happens in terms of institutions and in terms of individuals and in terms of imagined relationships of uh, power, responsibility, and accountability. Um, and how this is actually very different in terms of looking at the internet and in terms of looking at women's rights. You know, how these two actually, it's quite different models if you think about it and where you position yourselves. But I will take this now to a much more, um, from this kind of like, um, global level, I guess, to borrow that imagination, to a much more local level that is at the same time global. Um, and Bishaka, you know, you do a lot of, you bring a lot of um, different strands of expertise and experience with you. You work on sexuality issues, you are also very active in the Wikimedia Foundation, and you also do work with dis people with disabilities and sexualities. So I guess it would be great to get some of your experiences, especially in trying to negotiate some of these things, like how to bring all of these different things into particular spaces. Okay, I'll try and sort of, you know, just pull together some random thoughts. I think one of the interesting things is, like, when we talk about women, what does it actually mean on the internet? And I'll tell you what I mean. So, for instance, we know now from the latest broadband and gender report, which was recently published by the UN, that there are 2.8 billion users of the internet worldwide. And 1.3 billion of those are, wi are women, and we're talking billion. The interesting thing is, and this is something I've faced as a documentary filmmaker, people would come up to me and say, are you a woman documentary filmmaker? And I'd be like, I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'm a woman. And sometimes I'm like more documentary <laughs> filmmaker and sometimes I'm more woman and sometimes those identities come together and sometimes they don't. And I bet if you were to ask like, you know, a random selection of women users across the world, these two point, uh, the 1.3 billion, that are you a woman user? A lot of women would actually say, well, we are users of the internet, right? And s the woman identity wouldn't automatically surface because when you're using the internet, you're using the internet, you're a user. So the first point I want to make is if we just focus on those two words, if we really want to think of gender and governance and sort of women's rights, we first have to make sure that women have rights to all the things that users have rights to, right? We can't put women into some special box or ghetto and say, oh, they only need women's rights. We need users' rights. We can't have our networks shut down. We can't have our freedom of expression taken away, all the usual stuff, regardless of gender. And then I would say, 
there is a certain category within where your gender does matter. And that is the box where we talk about women's rights. So I would say that we really need to approach it in this sort of dual manner. That's one of the things that I've learned with sort of, you know, when you work with people who are disabled, sometimes they're disabled, sometimes they're women, et cetera, and with all the sort of groups we work with. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, when we think about women, we always juxtapose freedom and safety. And frankly, I would much prefer that we put freedom like first and that be the big, 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 big box, right? Because women enjoy many more freedoms on the internet than they face, like comparatively, the number of unsafe situations is much, much smaller. And I know we have a tendency to sort of talk about violence and abuse and all that stuff when we talk about women's rights, but let's not forget the big box. And let's not forget that in many countries, including India, where I come from, or many kinds of women, including women who are lesbian, transgender, or disabled women, cannot explore certain things offline, including sort of sexual desire, sexual exploration. Where's the space for that in countries where, like, you know, a woman is only expected to have sex to have children, right? So safety is, again, to me, a subset of freedom. It's not the other way around. And we have to really think about what that means in the internet context. I'd say that similarly, you know, openness from my Wikimedia experience, what I would actually bring is it's an open knowledge uh, context. And we found that only 15% of contributors to Wikipedia are women. And in the OpenStreetMap context, only 3% of contributors to OpenStreetMap are women, right? Here's the interesting thing. When we think of openness, we think open source, we think open knowledge, you know, open access, all these things. But we never look at it through a gender lens. So we never look at, is this openness really, like, is this culture open for everybody? Because one of the things that's common to OpenStreetMaps and Wikipedia is one of the barriers that women face is actually the culture. Open cultures are actually very conflict prone. People argue it out, they're sort of fighty. And this actually puts women, some women off, right? So, so we have to think of openness a little more broadly. And then just a couple more points, which is that when we, uh, again, think of women in the context of the internet and content, the minute we sort of start talking about things like harmful content, the tendency is to imagine that there's a woman at the receiving end of this harmful content who's somehow being harmed. And what I want to say is that to question the term harmful content, right? We often tend to look at sexual content as intrinsically harmful, even when it's not. We often at the policy level tend to sort of say that, you know, we should have laws against pornography. Why? To protect women. These are some of the justifications that are commonly used. So I think, again, we have to imagine women a little more broadly so that we are not, you know, imagining harms that don't exist, et cetera, et cetera, and really understanding the very wide and diverse range of women who use the internet for like many, many things. And final point is that, uh, you know, balancing sort of freedom of expression and women's rights, I'd say that this has always been a very contentious sort of issue and that these two sort of streams need to understand each other a little more, right? There are contexts in which you're, uh, like a woman faces sort of threats like rape threats, etc., online, where it's hard to say that she should become sort of superwoman and just keep like taking these rape threats and that nothing can be done about it and that any attempt to do anything is sort of suppressing freedom of expression because we have to keep in mind as users that your freedom of expression cannot, like, suppress my freedom of expression. So I'd say that's the sort of final thing I want to say. Thank you. Um, I would like to next open this to the floor, but before that, I guess I'd like to re just, you know, remind some of the really good key questions that was raised in this discussion. So some of them are about how do we, how do we unblack box multi-stakeholderism as a concept. What does this mean without, you know, being trapping ourselves into stakeholder, meaning just civil society, private sector, and so on and so forth. And with that, 
how do we trouble a multi-stakeholder internet governance space that apparently sometimes position us as voice without agency? So how do we exercise agency at this, within that expression of voice? How does actually dialogue translate into action? I think that also is part of the question. And um, how do we broaden the concept of openness um, with a gendered lens? And finally, what are our claims for freedoms for women, for women's rights beyond safety concerns, beyond just thinking about harmful content or issues around harm? What are actually some of the positive claims and demands for freedoms? And naming this is, I think, um, sometimes something that blocks us as well. So open to the floor. Everybody's an expert now. Proclaim your diversity. Valentina from Bosnia. I think that uh, I was thinking about the presence of uh, women or the women discussing to the internet the governance. But I also think that there is a new narrative where there is a strong agencies of women when they are online on social network or the way they act. But very often their agency, their freedom of expression is uh, attacked because they use uh, a way of wording uh, which, uh, which is considering borderline uh, with, uh, you know, pornography. It's not moral enough. It's not... Uh, uh, but I would like also to have this kind of agency considering to the governance. Maybe the internet governance is too squared, so we get moralized into this space because we have uh, not... We, we are not complying with certain standards. Yesterday at the opening, the rationale was for men, one woman, four men, one woman, and then when almost the people were leaving, we had the rush of three, four women. So, you know, order sometimes is not relevant, but the attention has a span of 20 minutes. So sometimes body do, bodies do matter. Um, any other comments or feedback? Thoughts? Lunchtime question marks? Hi, Chad Garcia Ramilo, also from APC. I guess it brings me back to what people were saying on the panel when, when we first engaged WSIS and we actually had a gender caucus. But this doesn't come from, this didn't start there. People who were active have been women's rights activists for a long time. We've been engaged in these issues around gender justice, around women's rights, equality for a very long time. And it is, I think, this constituency that will matter and will push, who have been here, who have not disengaged, wh you know, it, whatever the climate is. Because these are, this is what we, this is where the passion comes from. And I think, I mean, even from my, exp in APC, uh, my experience around APC is that we have really pushed the envelope really, really far. I mean, at the, at the point where we engage different people places we make those connections we network and look we, we wouldn't have this room full i think of um you know a uh, workshop or uh, at the very beginning we didn't have this but I, I i see that it's moving forward and i i do think that's what we need to bring for example around sexual rights i mean this 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 kinds of discussions issues have not been we're not part of the discourse or discussion in this space it is because we bring it here. And that's the only, I think that's the only really effective way of bringing that activism and really keeping it grounded and really keeping it engaged. And that's, that's, that's what I, I, I do believe in. Thanks. We have to both immerse and diffuse and infuse the space with our multiplicity, I suppose. Uh, and there's just no shortcuts about it in a way. Any other questions? Feedback, or com okay. Um, before we started the session, I talked with Nurani Numpani um, about this issue, about uh, the role of women in the multi-stakeholder environment. And she told me about a group uh, in the ITF, because the ITF in a way suffers from the same problem. Quite a number of women, but hardly visible because they are never taking leadership positions and so on. So she uh, sent me a letter. 
there's a group has been formed within the ITF, the sisters in the ITF, and they have um, uh, met several times and discussed this issue, and they have now sent, um, first of all, they argue, argue that uh, the ITF also suffers in terms of legitimacy because of this invisibility of women, and that something needs to change. And they suggested, they have sent a letter now to the ITF chair and suggested that a design team should be put together. This is a typical ITF solution. You have a problem and then you form a design team, like a sort of group of architects. Before you really implement something, you do something, you just try to sort of identify the problem and discuss various options, how it could be approached before you actually solve it. So perhaps that would be something that could be considered for the IGF too, to put together a design team and really look at the problem in a broader way and um, sort of identify causes and possible options. Come for the Gender Dynamic Coalition meeting on day four at 11 and let's form this design team. Um, I guess I will just, I, will, I think I will, I will end the session soon with last comments from the, from the discussants, unless there's any kind of like burning comments. Okay, there's one at the back. Uh, any more? That's it, yeah? Okay. Two, okay, two, and then, and then last, last kind of like closing remarks from the discussants. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate forum in which to raise this, but I would like some input or just some thoughts on this phenomenon in online gaming, so I don't know if I'm off track here, but where the woman is always portrayed as the damsel in distress, and she needs to be saved. It's called, I think the feminist movements call it the tropes versus damsel theory. And you always find that this hero goes out and either he's gonna euthanize her, do a mercy killing, because she just cannot anymore, or he takes her and he whisks her away somewhere romantic. And what I've seen is that in engaging with a lot of youth, um, on this, by the way, I work for the South African Human Rights Commission, but we do a lot of hands-on work with youth, and many of them live in the online space, and they cannot engage with a woman in the real world. So their perception of a woman is someone who needs to be rescued. So I just wanted to know whether, in discussing this multi-stakeholder cooperation, whether the IGF at any point has even looked at these gaming companies and how it is that they portray this damsel in distress and this female that needs to be saved at all costs. Thanks. It's a very critical question, actually, and has to do... I will leave this to be discussed by the discussion. I can already see, like, the wheels turning, but that is an absolutely relevant question to bring to this space. And, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, like, I love this topic. I think you guys are great. Uh, I love it. Um, it's true. It's so awesome. You know, one of the things I love about the... I always wonder, how do people want to govern the internet? It's such a chaotic space where people really do whatever the hell they want to do. And I think what I love about what women do online is this, you know, highlighting the strategies that they use. And my favorite strategies are the ones that are sort of like, fuck this shit, you know? Like, they get a Tumblr going that makes fun of misogyny. They get, like, they draw up comic superheroes that are, you know, just subverting the whole thing. You know, there's people who've reprogrammed games to save Mario instead of saving, what's her name? And there's these, these dads that have reprogrammed games so that their little daughters won't have to feel like, why do I have to be saved? Can't I be the main character? So I think um, there's, a, there's one article uh, that's very well written. It didn't make it to the published version because someone was late with it. But it's, uh, it's about feminists hacking um, these spaces and sort of like online resistance and like... Um, you know, just you know, femini feminists taking over these spaces in subversive kind of ways. So I was, I was wondering if you, you want to say something about these strategies that have been awesome and that have really, you know, flipped some of the misogyny online. So feminists hacking all kinds of spaces, from IG spaces to multi-stakeholder spaces to gaming spaces to other kinds of spaces. Last comments. Anita and then, oh, Bishaka and then Anita. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, so basically the uh, the damsels versus whatever it's, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that there was, I, you know, there was a study that was done on this by 
a feminist blogger called Anita Sarkisian. And the interesting thing is she challenged exactly the, you know, you can look it up online. Uh, she challenged exactly this kind of portrayal and raised a lot of money on Kickstarter to be able to do a project which would challenge this stereotypical portrayal of women in games. And here's the problem. What happened to her is that she faced a huge amount of violence online, right? Including, like, nasty comments. You know, her Wikipedia page was deleted. It was vandalized. People put in all sorts of, like, sexualized slurs against her. And I think the worst thing that happened was the creation of a game called Beat Up Anita Sarkeesian. And every time you went and you clicked on it, her face would become more bruised and bloodier and bloodier in the game. So which just goes to show, actually, sometimes, you know, in the cultures that exist online and sort of a somewhat anarchic atmosphere, which all of us enjoy as well at some level, but what happens is that when you try to challenge this kind of stereotypical sexist kind of stuff, you meet with, like, really grave consequences. And here's where I think Internet governance comes in because there really isn't anything for you to do at that point, except try to take it on with a bunch of friends, or you know, you try and blog about it, but there are no like human rights standards that recognize this kind of violence as as creepy as anything that happens in the offline world. And if you just type in her name and have a look at that image, you will know exactly what I mean. Yeah, thanks, Vishaka. I don't really know what one thing I should respond to. Um, but I think uh, one of the key ideas which um, I'm very grateful to the GIST Watch for having allowed me the luxury to read and write about it is the way in which politics itself is no longer the same in network society. Mm. I think that's a mistake uh, we make to imagine that we're all part of this historical continuity where politics is you know, people doing things and governments listening to them, then global multilateral, you know, negotiations, then you come back home and try to enforce a UN resolution and all of that. But I think um, there is a huge, I think, flux because of which the performative way, you know, in terms of gaming, you know, what we do as pushing back or, you know, uh, hacking, the performative way in which politics emerges is just one way of understanding network politics. But I think it has several um, other nuances and some of them not very encouraging for progressive politics. I'll give you an example of the anti-corruption movement in India. So every city had a, you know, candlelight vigilance and people swarmed the s uh, streets and never before in the history of contemporary India had, you know, the, the, the country witnessed people coming to the streets. But many groups, Dalit groups, older groups which are fighting free trade agreements, all of them pointed out to how this kind of presence and then going back, vanishing, has completely flattened out older debates. And you know, you're actually, the media is running behind this thing and imagining that the only agenda that unifies the country is actually this anti-corruption movement. Uh, that is one example. I mean. You can actually have many more, and I, in my paper in the Just Watch, I've analyzed the Egypt, sorry, just half, half, uh, 20 seconds more, um, analyzed the Egypt uh, context that, you know, at the end of the day, feminist movements in Egypt realized one thing, that whatever they do, informational and communicative power is but one of the forces in your arsenal. Power actually lies in so many other domains that even though the meta-narrative of politics changed with the West Asian Revolution, politics as you know democracy, politics as institutions did not really change. So then we really need to understand how to engage at that level in addition to un you know engaging at micro power. And I think that's a takeaway for us, even when you talk about the discourse of the IGF. It's not about being present, talking in sessions, et cetera, but to decode what is that discursive meta-narrative of power that is constructing the IGF as a political space. Thank you, Anita.
Um, and um, Jeanette, would you like, or, yeah, good. So, in short, please do um, take a copy of um, the Gizwatch preview. It's really a lot of food for thought. And download the full copy, uh, the full version when it comes down. And part of the decoding that Anita is talking about as well is in a chapter by Heike um, that talks about institutional review, whose internet is it anyway, which is actually, you know, part of the project of decoding. Before we end the session, actually, I would like to introduce our Indonesian partners who've been really very strongly present um, in this internet governance space. And I think this is critical. It really speaks to, like, you know, really open... What, what IGF means as an open space that really engages um, different kinds of constituents. Um, and, um, and, they, and, uh, and they would also like to read a statement um, that is quite symbolic to what we're discussing today, um, which is around, I'm sure you've seen, um, the Miss Internet Bali 2013 initiative that actually somehow just you know, reduces women's participation in this space. Uh, but I'll leave it to Camelia Manaf to, to read the statement. Hi, um, my name is Camelia Mana. I'm from um, Erotics Indonesia. It's a program actually about internet rights, women's rights, and sexuality, working together with Association for Progressive Communication. Um, so in this case, uh, because in, in the, during Internet Governance Forum 2013, we've been talking about how we want to uh, support a women's leadership and women's participation on internet governance and also uh, how we want to speak also about women's rights perspective uh, on the internet governance level. But uh, as we can see, uh, we, are, we would like to um, tell our protest about the initiative uh, done by Indonesian ISP Association. It is the competition of Miss Internet Bali because we feel that the concept of Miss Internet Governance, uh, Miss Internet um, Bali, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Miss Internet Bali, is it's, it's kind of like a concept that trying to put back women into domestic area, while in our case, it's like we want to support women in political participation. So here we go. We would like to make a statement. And um, to ABGI, Indonesian Internet, Indonesian Internet Service Providers Associations, Miss Internet Bali and Women's Participation at Internet Governance Forum 2013. We commend the motivation and commitment to encourage women and promote women's participation on the development and use of the internet. However, as advocates and activists working on women's rights in Indonesia and as participants of the Internet Governance Forum 2013, we are writing to register our concern on your Miss Internet Bali initiative as a flagship program under APG to promote safe, healthy, and productive use of the internet amongst Indonesian society. We further state our protest on the promotion of this program in conjunction with the Internet Governance Forum 2013. The decision to run the program in a format that is strongly reminiscent of beauty pigeons position women as a passive objects of beauty rather than active, diverse, and empowered citizens and users of the Internet who save and divine the world we live in. This can have a defect of perpetuating gender stereotypes that act to further marginalize and discriminate women instead of promoting their rights and concerns, which run completely contrary to the state objective of your program. The approach of this program also runs a great risk of reducing women's contribution to the development and use of the internet into becoming simply a marketing ploy and further communicates the message of the commodification of women's image and representation in, this, in the shaping information societies. This is discriminatory. The Internet Governance Forum is a United Nations mandate space, and as such, we expect and in demand adherence to respectful and non-discriminatory standards of behavior. As participants of the Internet Governance Forum 2013, who are working to advance gender equality and the active participation of women in Internet Governance policy dialogue and process, we see this a huge step back taken by organizers in this process. We strongly recommend that the commitment to recognize and promote women's participation on the de development and use of the internet be conceptualized and implemented with the, the empowerment and human rights of women as the framework instead. For example, by engaging in the gender dynamic coalition, 
putting forward issues for women's rights and leadership in internet governance, and supporting the full diversity of women's leadership. This is coalition of um, Women's Network of Association for Progressive Communication and also a uh, women's group in Indonesia. And thank you. Uh, we also have uh, t-shirts and publications um, related to our statement. So please, just we give it for free as part of our campaign to fight for Miss Internet Valley. Yeah. Thanks, Camille. And thank you very much to the discuss. Oh, sorry, is there a question? This, um, we will be putting it up online very soon on APC.org. Yep. Yep. Sorry, please do not ask questions about T-shirts to me because I'm not in control. <laughs> sorry. Yes. When you have the link online, it would be good if it uh, can be promoted to everybody and maybe they can tweet it uh, using the hashtag of the IPA. Yes, that's, that's the plan. Yeah. So please, when you see the link to the statement online, please help to distribute the message if you are in support of the statement. And I would also like to thank the panelists who are at hand. I'm sorry, I just have to close. I think we've run out a little bit over time, so I apologize for this. But thank you to all of the panelists, and thank you for coming to the launch. Thank you very much.